good. Let's see if any, it's building an audience. <laughs> Go on, people. Hey, everybody, it's me, Susan Tisdale, with the awesome Holly Bridgman. <laughs> and we are on my patio, and we are having coffee and chocolate orange whiskey mousse with homemade whiskey whipped cream. Yes, we threw, some, we threw a, la a little dab of whiskey into the whipped cream. A little dab of whiskey never hurt anybody. <laughs> In fact, it makes it better. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh boy, is that good. Mm. That, I like that. that is really good. I like the orange. Mm -hmm. And the scotch. Mm -hmm. And next time I know to get a bit of orange and not zest big chunks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was. It's good. Mm. If I wasn't already happily married, I suppose. <laughs> mm. This has been such a fun day. It has been. Let the record reflect. I have not had a potty mouth all day long. Nope, you've been very good. Out of respect for Hallie and <laughs> Shelly. You have done dishes all day. I have. I have dishpan. Look at that. I have dishpan hands. <laughs> I do. They're I all need red from the water. They're all wrinkly. Unless I do that, and then all the wrinkles go away. <laughs> we should go get manicures next. You know, I have a place. <laughs> they do awesome pedicures, right? too. Mm -hmm. I go with Shelly. Um, she drug me out one night. It was cold. And she's in her LaRue's. Have you seen those LaRue ladies? Yes. <laughs> oh, my stars. Shelly has an addiction. She needs rehab for her little LaRue <laughs> addiction. But uh, she was barefoot. <laughs> she had her little flip-flops on, and she was quite happy. So, anyway, I'm going to have some more of this. <laughs> oh, really good. I've never made a mousse. I still haven't. Hallie made this. She did a fine job. Mmm. That whiskey, I'm telling you what. It's simple. Everything in it is simple. It's potent, too. It's like five ingredients. Chocolate, orange, cream, sugar, eggs, no sugar. No sugar? Chocolate chips is it. Well, what did you have on the stove? The caramel sauce for the cake. But how'd you make the caramel sauce for the cake? Oh, for the cake. That's right. I'm getting them mixed up. Maybe I shouldn't have any more whiskey. <laughs> so I melted chocolate chips with heavy cream and uh, whiskey, mm -hmm. with scotch whiskey, and then beat egg whites and beat egg yolks, and that's it. Okay. All right. It was good. Yeah. I think the cake was the best thing we made though. <laughs> God bless America, that was good cake. The meat pies were pretty good too. Oh, and you're on the fly dip. And I'm on the fly dip, yeah. Yep, Hallie Bridgman's on the fly dip. That's I'll need to go. remember what to put down when I, I make I don't the know. It was dill and chives and sour cream and mayo and... Maybe some Worcestershire sauce. Yes, we're, we're not saying it right. <laughs> what, how did your friend in, in England say Worcestershire? Worcester. Worcester. I think it's Worcestershire. Just Worcestershire. But I know it's not Buckingham Palace. I was talking to Karen Amanadra one day, and we were Skyping. And she's British. I mean, she lives in, I don't know if it's London or around London. But we were doing a Skype session one morning, absolutely hilarious. And I said, I want to go see Buckingham Palace one day. I thought this girl was going to fall off her chair. <laughs> it's not Buckingham. It's Buckingham. 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 I'm like, oh, okay. Well, here we have to pronounce everything. <laughs> and if it's got ham in it, we're saying ham. <laughs> so I haven't talked to her in a long time, but she's a really sweet lady. She wrote a really good book. And I'm going to, I cannot remember the name of it, but it was based on one of uh, Mr. Darcy. Yeah. What happened afterwards? Jane Austen. Jane Austen. But it was what happened after. What was the name of that book? You're I'm so bad. The Jane Austen fans are going to want to butcher me when this is over with. I'm sorry. I it's not the zombie one, is it? No, it's not the zombie <laughs> one. But it was really, really good. So I liked Karen's books. She was a good writer. She really was. So anyway, we're just enjoying my patio and my patio furniture. Got the cushions out and... They've been in the garage all winter, so... Welcome to April. Something could hatch. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll see me move faster than you ever thought I could move. Because <laughs> I don't like bugs. I don't, I don't like bugs. I 
I hate bugs. Anyway, my son has done a fabulous job yes, today he has. being our videographer. So I Thank you. Yes. Someday Michael's gonna be standing on the stage accepting his Academy Award for whatever <laughs> movie. And he's going to thank everybody he's ever met in his entire life, but he will forget to thank me. We'll, we'll, we can thank you now. We can thank me. Yes, thank me now, Michael. Thank <laughs> me for all I've done for you. <laughs> Seriously, dude, you can't. No. <laughs> I love you, Michael. I'm really proud of you. But yes, Michael's going to make some awesome movies when he's older. So, I already know what some of them are. No, you don't. You're going to remake a Godzilla movie. No. No? King Kong? No. When my brother, who was a film student, you was like in uh, middle school, he wrote a book called, or he wrote a movie script called The Aliens Take Over the Cosby Show. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the aliens, the Sigourney Weaver aliens, the oh alien aliens. Oh, my stars. See, that's something no Michael more. would like. No. It was awesome. Yes, With sure. the things that come out of the stomach. Yeah. Oh, my stars. Cliff Huxtable. Is that, is that the Cosby Show? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He got... He got his stomach popped with an alien in it. <laughs> well, Michael likes monster movies like Godzilla, <laughs> King Kong, Mothra. Um, what's the one that was my muse for a little while? It's I still have it on my buffet in there. Hedera the Smog Monster. Yes, Hedera the Smog Monster. She, that was my my regular muse wasn't working. She wasn't talking to me. She hated me <laughs> for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I went into Michael. I said I need a muse, and he was being a smart aleck. And he goes here. <laughs> and I'll be damned if I didn't sit down and write 4,000 words that day. It was the first time I've written in weeks. So I keep Hedora there. Or Hedra? Hedra? Hedora? It depends. On what part of the country? Probably a Japanese. Like, <laughs> kind of like They're um, all Japanese. just a semiasis. It depends on what far, part of the country you're from. Because in some places it's just a semiasis. In others it's just a semiasis. So Buckingham, Buckingham, whatever. Potato, potato, <laughs> tomato, tomato, <laughs> cinnamon or cinnamon. <laughs> yes, I've had a lot of whiskey today. No, it really, really haven't. No, I had a little bit. I had a shot, maybe. So, we're going to talk about books. We've already talked a little bit about books all day long, um, off and on. But Hallie does, Hallie, I really have to tell you this, and I'm not just blowing sunshine up your skirt because you just made me all this wonderful food. <laughs> But you really are a very, very, I, I hate to say good, because you're beyond good, but I don't want to say great, because it sounds like I'm just being... Sunshine like a, blower. Yeah, I'm a sunshine blower, but I'm not blowing sunshine. You are a damn good writer. Thank you. I mean that, because you've just, man, with that sapphire book, you pulled me in and I'm like... <laughs> I mean, that was one of those that I was up all night reading that book, yeah. and as soon as, and I was supposed to write the next day, and I didn't. I went right back in. I'm like, mm, I'm going to sit in my recliner, just read a couple pages, and then I was done. And yeah, I was up all night and up all day. <laughs> but I really like that. Um, so, what do you think makes a good writer? Because some people will say, will say that you can't be a good writer unless you're a good reader, and you don't read a lot. I don't read. No, I've read your books, mm -hmm. and uh, she flips for all her people that follow her. She flips through the dirty parts. I do. They're not dirty. They're not. I don't read them though. Yeah, I skip through a lot too. It's like ah. Uh, but you know the thing is, is that <laughs> even when I was a reader, uh -huh. I read things like uh, books based on the screenplays. Okay. So I think always, even as a reader, I was a very visual reader. Mm -hmm. You mean adaptations? Novel. Well, I would say the book based on the or written from the screenplay. So I read like, well, these are my style of movies. I read mm -hmm. Terminator, uh -huh. and yep. I read novelizations. They do that a lot, right? So it isn't a movie based on a book, but it's a book based on a movie. Yes, but they use the original screenplay to write it. They use an earlier draft. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those were the kind of books I would eat up, uh -huh. and uh, and and so if a, if an author is a visual writer, mm -hmm. then I can I can read them. Mm -hmm. And I'm completely content. So um, I think that what feeds me as a writer is watching really corny action movies with a hint of romance. I mean, because that's what I like to, to watch, and so that's what I end up writing. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, on top of that, I have, um, I believe, a gift from the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to 
uh, convey a faith message at the same time. There you go. So, but I think whatever whatever works for each writer. You know, there's writers who say that they read voraciously. I can't imagine that anymore. Well, you Just are because busy. I mean, you spend three hours a day in your kitchen. I do. You grind your own wheat. When do you have time to I, read? I make all the bread we eat. Exactly. I, exactly. Do you yeah. ever do audiobooks? Do you like to listen to audiobooks? I I did. Uh, I used to listen to audiobooks when I traveled, and I remember the first audiobook I ever listened to was John Grisham's The Client, oh. which was the one about the um, insurance. Yes. Okay? Yes. So I was going from Florida to West Virginia, and I was alone, mm -hmm. and I'm driving along, and I'm listening to this book, and I'm into this book, and then I see the sign that says, Welcome to North Carolina, and I said, North Carolina? <laughs> When was I in South Carolina? <laughs> and I got to my parents' town, and I pulled into a parking lot and listened to the end of the book before I went to their house. I've been driving for like 15 hours. Oh, my stars. And I had yeah. to finish this book. That's so. a good narrator, though. Yeah. That's a very good narrator. So I love I loved listening to audiobooks for years. I've traveled so much with my children, and they listen to audiobooks. And my biggest problem now as a writer <clears throat> is that there is an internal editor that I cannot ignore and I cannot turn off. And so, as soon as a book, as soon as bad writing or um, a plot that I figure out mm -hmm. happens, I can no longer read. It's like I'm, I'm bored with the book and I don't want to keep going unless I'm editing it. Okay. Got so, that. it takes a lot to, it takes really excellent storytelling mm -hmm. to break that for me. Okay. And I don't have the patience to find that author. Okay. So I just simply don't read. Okay, gotcha. But gotcha. there's been a few that I've read that I've really enjoyed. Yeah. And there's been a few, a lot of audiobooks I really enjoyed. Yeah. I love my narrator, Brad Wills, Mr. Sexy. <laughs> Got to have dinner with him a couple weeks ago when I was down south with you. Um, but he's he's a really good narrator. Yeah. He makes me forget I wrote the book. That's awesome. And that's, that's, that's a talent. Yeah. Because I've had other narrators who... Those books never went live. <laughs> Long story. <laughs> Cost a lot of money to have those books not go live. Yeah. But I kept waiting. It's like, no, that's not how you're supposed to read that. No, no, you didn't do that right. So and I think when you're talking audiobooks, uh, your narrator is key. Oh, yeah. But you can have a fabulous narrator in a really sucky book. My narrator and, is amazing. Yes. Gene yes. Rowley. Yes. And he, he sent me a message one time. Well, what he did was leave the rough cut in what I was listening to as he's sobbing after reading a chapter of one of my books. He's like, how can you do this to a person? Yes. I can't even keep reading and sobbing. And I'm like, I think I might have done a good job with that book. Exactly. I'll get those from Brad. He'll call me up and say, damn it, Susan, you did it again. Mike, you bring me that for just a minute. Um, I need you to run in the house and get me my laptop. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to flip this around for a minute. And where did it go? So I've got my son going inside so they can see uh, comments and such. So we've got, hi, Pat. Hi, Karen. I don't know who else is here. Oh, lots of people. Oh, Julie. Hi, Julie. She's got a cute little girl, and her <laughs> husband is so sweet. I love Rusty. There's my friend Christy. Hi, Christy. How are you, dear? Are you having fun? Yes, thank, my, thank Michael for, yes, he's doing a fabulous job. Thank you. And Christy again, what does she say? Yay for doing the dishes. <laughs> yeah, I've been done a lot of dishes today. And thank you for your carefulness, carefulness. with your words. You're welcome. <laughs> I can be a good girl sometimes. Yes. Mama raised me right. There's certain times for dirty words. There's certain times when you don't want to say those dirty words. And I appreciate you opening up your home. Oh, you're welcome. I love doing stuff like this. Um, here in a couple weeks, I think I'm going to uh, do some more of these. And we're going to probably play Pictionary with my readers. Oh, fun. Um, I'm stealing that idea from Josephine Blake. I'm going to give her the credit. I'm going to turn that around for you, Mike. Maybe. There you go. So, uh, Josephine Blake is an author who I recently just discovered. And she runs the Brewer Mill on Facebook. Absolutely. One of the most adorable, beautiful girls that you've ever seen in your entire life. But um, she was on the Brewer Mill the other night. Playing Pictionary with the readers. I'm like, I, and then before I knew it, I'm like, I know what it is, but I didn't want to say anything because I, you know, yeah. So that's just me. But I might do Pictionary 
here in a few weeks with some of my readers. So, chocolate orange whiskey mousse. Okay, there's the one we want. So, hopefully I'll have some Wi-Fi out here. Okay. Hi, Alberta. Tanya Gibbons Smalley. She's my girl. She I love to Tanya. Be here with us. She, you should be here, Tanya. You would be having so much fun with us. You would. And there's Pat. And there's other people on this not telling me everybody. Lori Miner. Marsha. Let's see. Lori Miner I went to school with. We were in high we graduated high school together. There were only 43 kids in my entire graduating class. Oh wow. And that was from two towns combined. Yeah, I led a kind of a sheltered life. <laughs> so anyway, back we're talking about books. And so what what else do you think makes a good writer? I think uh, it's not just a good vocabulary because you could tell a really good story with a lot of little words. Yeah. I think it's the ability to paint a picture. I, I have to agree. Um, one of the best writers that I've ever, ever read was Carl Purden. If you all have never read Carl Purden, you got to start reading Carl Purden. The Night Train was the first book of his I read. And I will tell you a funny story about this. So I loved that book so much within, you know, how you're on a Kindle and you're, you know, you swipe. I call that a page. I was three pages in and I had tears running down my neck. Three pages in and I am a crying, sobbing mess. Yeah. And it's a story about a little boy who's just abused by his dad, neglected by his mom, and he decides to run away from home on the night train. So this is his story, his journey. So I loved this book so much that I bought paperback copies, like 10 of them. And I started passing them out to people. I have never done that before in my life. So I give my mother a copy of this book. Now I've already published three or four books, right? So I give mom a copy of, of The Night Train. And she loved it so much that she loaned it to my Uncle Fred. And he had to give it back under threat of death. Um, so I was telling Carl one day how much my mother loved this book. And so he sent her an autograph signed copy. Aww. I know, right? So you could have gone to my mother's house, God rest her soul, and said, where's that Carl Purden book? Well, she had it hidden over here in her little <laughs> box. It was wrapped in tissue paper inside a Ziploc bag inside another Ziploc bag. Okay? This is it, and no, you can't touch it. Well, where are Susie's books? Oh, they're around here somewhere. <laughs> But she was, she loved that book. Everybody who I've ever talked to that has read that book loved it. So, but he doesn't use great big words. He uses, I don't know how he does it. If I could write Scottish historical romance, like Carl writes his fiction novels, I would be a gazillionaire. That's all I got to say. Well, you so. know, another thing I think that makes a good writer is the ability to create realistic characters that the reader can identify with. Exactly. Because if you can do that, then the writing almost doesn't matter. If they're, if they're really good characters with, mm -hmm. in realistic situations with realistic motivations, that the yes. reader can, I, can say, this could be me. Exactly. Or this or was this me. Was my, or this was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I get, I get letters regularly. Mm -hmm. And it's always so funny when it happens from readers that say, I was thinking about Robin and Tony the other day and wondering how they were. Then I remembered that they were fictional characters. <laughs> That is the best compliment true. that you can get. Exactly. It's what happens with mm -hmm. with good characters, well, like character development. I've had people email, uh, email me and, and say things like, you know, your books got me through a very difficult time in my life, or I was that abused person, like Layden and Layden's daughter. I was that abused person, and that book gave me hope and made me realize I could change my life if I wanted to. Yes, and it's it's stuff like that. When we hear from readers, at least when I hear from readers, um, you know, telling me how their a book I wrote changed their life, that just makes me want to keep writing. Oh yeah, and that's why it's it's really it's always been important for me for my writing to get better. That's always been my goal. Um, but now when I'm writing. I feel like I'm writing with more of a purpose. Yeah. It's not just, okay, this is the story I want to tell. 
I want that story to be purposeful. I want there to be a message to it. Sometimes they're just stories for fun. There is no hidden message. But sometimes I want to just, like when I go, when I'm writing Brogan's Promise, it's all about alcoholism. And that's going to be a purposeful, purposeful book. Just like Frederick's Queen was a very purposeful book because it dealt, dealt with rape, it dealt with um, abuse, and how you can overcome that if you have faith and um, someone in your life that is stronger than you are yeah. to help you through it. So that's one of the reasons I love Frederick's Queen so much. Um, but I'm loving Brogan's Promise. It's I've introduced some new characters. Hildy or Hilda and Tildy. <laughs> these two old women. Oh, are my readers going to love these two women? Because they are hilarious. <laughs> and uh, Brogan has nicknamed them and Rose the, the three she devils. <laughs> because they're plotting to get him to marry Marguerite Mc, McTavish. So, um, anyway, so I think it's important to. To, I mean, you can have all the pretty words in the world in your head and put them down on that piece of paper, but if the story doesn't engage your readers, then it doesn't matter how many pretty words you know. Sure. Because you can really tell a really great story with some simple words. Yes. Now, you like to write big big books, or do you like to write novellas, or in between? I depends on the story. Exactly. Thank you. This is one more reason I love her. I have heard writers say, well, I had to cut 25,000 words out of the story because I went over my word count. And I'm like, why? Why would you cut out 25,000 words? Well, I don't understand needed. that. Exactly. Are you sure they weren't needed? Because they might have been important. <laughs> so, um, The Boy Bride, I sent it to my editor and it was it was just like 10, 10 words under 150,000 words. And when she said it back, it was just a little over 146,000 words. So I'm like, I can deal with that. So um, one of the things she cut out, we were talking about this inside. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> Alec had a little habit. Every time he got around Leona, he liked to twine a bit of hair <laughs> around his finger. Twine a lock of hair around his finger. Every time he got nearer. I didn't realize I was, I was doing that. And... Uh, I will show you what she wrote. I've got screenshots because this is hilarious. And then I had things like stand before her. I don't realize I'm doing that because a lot of times when I'm writing, it's like a movie playing out in my head and I'm trying to tell everybody what's going on. And uh, so there were two things that apparently, okay, why is this not working? Why is this not working, Michael? Okay. Not my fault. Right there. It's right there. I can't read that. Why is my mouse not working? <laughs> anyway, she said something along the lines that she would just do a little happy dance on her little tippy toes and I would just stop using this certain phrase for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, I will try. <laughs> and then I'm like, you don't like where he, you know, wraps the lock of hair around, uh, around his finger? She said it's cute two or three times, but not 240,000 times. I didn't realize I had it in there that many times. So anyway, a good editor I think is vital. Oh yeah. You've got to have it. Now who do you use? Is it your husband? My husband is my first editor. Okay. And then it goes to Heather McCurdy, who okay. is my second editor. Okay, now what kind of editing does she do? She does the line editing. The she line editing? The, and she'll do she'll do content. Mm -hmm. But at that point Greg's already had it and so yes. the content's already good. So it's really clean? It's you clean. send it to her clean? Yeah. I send such dirt to my editor that she's going to start wanting to charge me combat duty pay. Well, you know what's funny is I sent, uh, at the beginning of last year, in March, I sent her a book that Greg had not edited mm -hmm. because he was in the middle of starting a new job and just had no time. <laughs> and I was go. like, <laughs> she, I said, this is the roughest you'll ever get me. I'm sorry. And she wrote back and said, I honestly think this is the best writing you've ever done. Oh, sweet. So I don't know if it was the lack of editing or if it was just <laughs> truly that good of a book. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, I know a lot, like Tanya and Crosby, she sends stuff to her editor. Clean, clean, clean. You can cook lobster on it. It's so clean. Not me. <laughs> I get that book done. It's like, I can't look at this anymore. That's what I gets. gotta send it. Yeah, I have to gets. send it. So, uh, so, yeah, Catherine Lynn Davis, if you're watching this, there's no hope for me, dear. I'm, <laughs> there's just no hope. But um, I had used my mother-in-law, who's fabulous. She's fabulous. But she comes at it um, 
with the experience of a newspaper editor, which is a different kind of writing than writing fictional books. So uh, I use Katherine Lynn Davis and I still use Judy as my editors and I take you know both of what they have to say in into consideration um, and usually I just accept all their changes. They're <laughs> usually right and I'm like oh I didn't know that. So um, and then I have a final proofer and so I have three stages and then it goes to my beta readers and my advanced uh, arcs. arcs but I call it my early review. So do you use those? I do. I have a street team. Hallie's yep, allies. Team. Hallie's allies. Minor Susan's Highland lassies. Yep. My lassies. I love my lassies. <laughs> I do. They're awesome. Yep. And you'll all be getting a copy of the book very soon. I give all my street team members free copies. Yeah. I do because they work hard for me and they're good women. So I do the same thing. Yeah. I have to. So um, what else do we want to talk about? We've talked about writing. What else do we want to talk about? <laughs> I can sit here all night long and just, you know, jibber jabber. But I want this to be a purposeful conversation. So what else do we want to talk about? I'm getting a little cold. I'm thinking about sending Michael up the blanket. But, yeah. <laughs> I have had so much fun with you today. It's been a blast. It has been. And I had fun with you when we were in Kentucky. A couple, was it a week or two ago? I don't even it remember. It was two weeks ago. It was two weeks ago. Yep. It was, it was uh, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day, yes. The, the, the um, corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> I've actually been craving this. Have you really? I wonder if I could make this. You I bet could. I could. I bet I could. I bet it wouldn't taste as good as yours, though. You don't say that. You well, don't know. Yeah, we've been funny. <laughs> you spent the day in the kitchen with me. You don't have to be nice anymore. <laughs> so you're going to be here all night. You're going to go home tomorrow. No, I'm going well, to Dayton, Ohio tomorrow. Yes. To meet my boys, Greg and the boys at um, the Air Force Museum. Mm -hmm. And so Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is there. And the right is from the Wright brothers. Yes. So the field where they did their first flight, so it's really the oldest airport in the world. Oh, sweet. Uh, they have a flight simulator of the Wright plane. <gasps> oh, that's so my boys are going to go. Oh, they're going to eat that up, aren't yep. they? Yep, they're really looking forward little to Jeb, it. Little Scott, my little boys. <laughs> I cannot be their grandmother. <laughs> they would have ponies and dirt bikes and whatever they wanted. I would be so bad. I'm really bad. <laughs> so at the Air Force Museum, there's this big wall of uh, models of every plane you can imagine behind glass. They're models, little ones. Okay. And so I have pictures of them from little boys up until now where they are they go to that wall and they find their favorite airplane uh -huh. and they point to it. So. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they do tomorrow because I won't get there till they're done. Well, you're such a good mom. So I can afford to do stuff like that when my girls it's were It's free. Little. Well, it's try to get to Dayton, Ohio when you've got, you know, 50 cents for a gallon of yeah, gas. Yeah, that's true. You but know, the museum that, itself is 80s. free. Yes. Okay. Yes, but there would have been too far to go. Are you having fun, Mike? You just look like you're having the time of your life. <laughs> He's so thankful to be able to do this. <laughs> he is, but it's experience because you're going to make wonderful films someday. Mm -hmm. You are. I know you are. I wasn't doubting it. So what has been your funnest part today, Michael? What did you like eating the most? Was it the chocolate cake with the caramel sauce? Those kitchen cooked chips I got out of the cabinet were pretty nice. Oh, I'm going to beat this child. Okay, whoever's watching, I'm going to beat him. And you will all be <laughs> witnesses. And I don't care. I can do the gel time. You're such a smart guy. I should have known better. <laughs> That's my question. I should have known it would be something smart alecky like that. So how many hours a day do you write? Does it vary day to day or between four and six? Between four and six? Now you're an early riser. You get up and write before you take the boys to school? No, I get up and walk. Mm -hmm. I walk for an hour. And then so I do that at four forty five. And then How I, can we be friends? I do, <laughs> you and me and Shelly. I don't get this. It this makes morning, sense that you and Shelly would be besties. <laughs> Saturday morning, away from family, yeah. pets, yeah. breakfast made. Yeah. For 4.45, yeah. I was like, or 4.55, I woke uh -huh. up. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> what do I do I now? guess I'm up. I'm up. <laughs> I work. I work. I was still sleeping. Yeah. I wrote a blog post for Faithful. But oh, um, I... So then I take the boys to school, and I'm home by 8, mm -hmm. and uh, I write from 8 to 2. Okay. 
and there's lunch in there with my husband. Yes. And <clears throat> so she's a much better wife than I am. I'm usually like, you're in the kitchen. <laughs> there's peanut butter. No, I usually cook lunch. No, he usually he only gets about a half hour of lunch Monday through Friday. He always comes home for lunch every single day, but he's usually in such a hurry that there's no time to cook him anything for lunch. So occasionally it'll be a fried egg sandwich. I'm so bad. I really am. Well, he'll call and say he's on his way, and I'll start making lunch. So I'll make, like... I can't even get Kevin to answer his text Stir messages. fry and rice, or... You are like such a good woman. Homemade um, corned beef hash or something. And then... And it's then he leaves and goes back to work, and I have about an hour, and I don't usually go back to writing. No. Because once that mojo's broken, it's yeah. hard to get back into it. Yeah. So, so that's when I do other things. Other things, like back-end things, back is what things. I call them. Mm -hmm. So I like to write in the morning. Uh, and because my office is still in the dining room, please pray that, this, that my office is done soon because I'm about ready to lose my ever-loving mind. But I will tell people, in my fortress of solitude, do not speak. <laughs> and so they, they know. My, Michael and Kevin are really good about trying not to disturb me. Yeah. Um, but I admire anybody who can write in their house when there are little kids in the house. Yeah, I don't. I don't have anybody. I know lots of authors who do that. I and know. I don't. To me, it's like trying to put on pantyhose on over wet blue jeans. I just don't know how you do it. I can't escape into the, the Halley world. No. Like that image that you're trying to write to doesn't exist. Yes. It's like. No. Children. <laughs> exactly. Children um, present. Children so. present. And but, you want to be there for your kids. And you don't want to be yelling, go in the other room. And you don't want to sit them down in front of a TV or anything like that. But I know lots of authors who don't do any of those things. Their kids just play quietly while they write. And it's like, that ain't, that ain't normal. That's just not normal. I have friends who homeschool and write. I don't know how to do that. I can't. See, I'm not that kind of woman, people. I made my kids go to public school because <laughs> they kept them every day for seven and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> this summer, though, I'm contemplating like a 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. writing sprint every mm -hmm. morning just to not lose that production time in the summer because I traveled so much this year. I went oh, to you were a Hawaii traveler. and Portland, mm -hmm. Oregon mm -hmm. and Tulsa, Oklahoma yeah. and Knoxville, Tennessee and then Sydney, Australia. <laughs> I know. So jealous So of that I trip. did all of that and didn't write anything. I'm still kind of, I think I still might be jet lagged. You could be. <laughs> Um, so I lost a lot of writing time, and I think that I'm going to try to do like the 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. sprint five days a week in the summer. You're a good woman. <laughs> Someone wants to know what was the name of the cookbook. I don't know. It's in the house. Um, I will post a cover of the cookbook later. Uh, Friends with uh, Christy Sicilo. Let's see who else is here. Oh, I don't know. There's lots of messages, and I will not be able to keep up with them. Um, but we're going to post all the recipes, the cookbooks, links, all that. I'll have that on my blog eventually. I'll take care of it today. You'll take care of it today. You are such a seed. This is why you have friends like this. Because they, they've got your back. <laughs> they've got your back. So, um, so you have lots of author friends. Is your circle tight, though? I mean, I have lots of author friends. Then I have a tight circle. I have very few people that I live in that little, that little tiny bubble is tiny, where I share book ideas and, and things like that. I don't really do that with people. You don't do that? Well, I have Greg. You have, yeah, see, my husband's a carpenter. He does not understand the creative mindset. And I, <laughs> I do feel sorry for him for living with me, a writer, and then my son, a future filmmaker, because Michael and I are able to just bounce ideas off each other all the time. And Kevin just sits there and it's like ping pong. And he's like, it makes my head hurt. He can't make his, you know, left brain, right brain. And uh, he's a very logical thinking person, very analytical. And I'm the furthest thing. There's never, <laughs> logic rarely ever plays into it. Um, yeah, so I feel sorry for my husband. So I can't bounce ideas off him. In fact, I tried to bounce an idea off of him. I wasn't actually bouncing an idea off of him. This could be a spoiler alert. So if you've, never, if you've never read Frederick's Queen, you need to mute your computer right now. So I was explaining to him how I was killing my bad guy off in Frederick's Queen. 
And I'm like, so there's this grappling hook, right? And I'm getting all excited and I'm explaining it to him. And my husband, his eyes just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he looks at me and he's like, remind me never to make you mad. And I said, that's because I know where to hide the body. I I'm an author and I can come up with a really good cover story. I've come up with worse. Oh, I know you've come up with way worse. And we're not going to talk about them right now. Why not? Uh, because we're not. You and I can talk about them later. But anyway, you, I just can't, it's, I can't talk to him. And that's okay because... He couldn't talk to me about building the house. I'd be just like, boom, everything would go over my head, <laughs> everything. And he doesn't like to talk to me about building stuff because <laughs> when he was redoing the living room, when he was expanding it, making it all bigger, we were annexing the, the front half, half of the front porch. We were, I will never forget it. He's explaining to me how the switches are going to work on, on the wall by the door. There, was, there were four, four clippies, four little whatever those are called. And he said, now this one will turn on the porch light. This one's going to turn on that ceiling fan, and this one's going to turn. And he's explaining it all to me, and I look at him, and I go, are you sure? <laughs> that man, I'm telling you what, he, he's been building houses since he's 15 years old. Hell yes, he's sure. And, and I'm, what that translates to is, I'm not sure I understand. Could you please explain it to me in words that even a two-year-old can understand? Right. So... He's very good about explaining to me things like that because I just don't get it. I don't understand how one wire is black and one's red, and when you put them together, it does, you know, X, Y, or Z. I don't understand that. Right. That makes no sense to me. Can't you use a blue and yellow wire? I know. Why does it have to be black and red? Why can't we use fuchsia or lime and green? I just don't get it. I think you could. It's just not accepted. It's not a guy thing, though. It's not, you know, it's always red, it's always black, it's always white, it's always yellow. They've been building bombs. Sniff the red wire. I'm like, well, how do you know that they use the proper wiring? Exactly. <laughs> they could have psyched you out. It yeah. could really have been a perfect wire. That would be wire. good in a book. That would. <laughs> that would. <laughs> my poor husband. But it takes a really big man to be married to me. And my husband's not a large man. I don't mean it that way. <laughs> you know, I called up a friend. I went to see a... Um, I went to see a Christian rock concert mm -hmm. in a big, giant church in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And the name fails me. So Crowder, Jimmy Crowder, yeah, Crowder band. Okay. All right. And so their big name, mm -hmm. this place was packed, and I was thinking, I was writing Harmony for Steve at the time, okay. which is about a Christian pop yes. star. And I was thinking, this would be the perfect venue for this book. So mm -hmm. I then was on Facebook and saw that a friend from church who was also uh, one of the room moms for my son, Scott, mm -hmm was the event coordinator for that oh, venue. Did you reach out to her? Of course I did. Of course you did. So I, what I did was called her up and <coughs> said, I want to blow up your church. Can I come look through the backstage? See, see, a normal, you can't, <laughs> only writers can get and away with that. you know what she did? She was like, sure. Sure. And so she met me at the back door of the, the, but she knew the you building. Were a she knew as a writer. She yeah. obviously, she didn't ask. I'm sure that she momentarily must have thought, why? And then remembered or something. Yes. But she met me with the facilities guy, oh, a map sweet. of the place, taking me through it all, and then got me backstage passes to the Kayla Christmas tour so I could oh, see sweet. how they set up the stage. Oh, and awesome. All this stuff. And the whole time I'm talking to the facilities guy saying, okay, could I access this if I wanted to blow it up? <laughs> exactly. Could I, would it work to do this? And Yes. And, you know, I, I, and I, if I park a car bomb here, could it blow into the church enough? And and he was on it with me. Yes. And it was awesome. awesome. See, we can't, as authors, we can't just walk in someplace and say, oh, that's pretty wallpaper. Oh, no. Yeah, looking no. for exits? Yeah, I'm at a Crowder concert saying, how am I going to blow this Exactly. <laughs> We're looking for ways, you know, that, that a spy could get in yeah. or, you know, just all, you don't want in here. I'm just going <laughs> to shut up. But yeah, that's how the author mind, how author mind works. Yep. It's not, it's not normal. <laughs> it's just not normal. <laughs> But it's fun. Sure. It is fun. Now, have you written your whole life? No. No? No. I was married, had a two-year-old, mm -hmm. and my boss, so this was late 90s, mm -hmm. and um, I had never had a computer as an adult. Okay. So my boss, we redid all of our computers at work, and at Christmas time, he just gave me one of the old ones, and I took okay. it home with me, and I set it up, and that was my first computer at home. And so New Year's Eve that night, I woke up at like two in the morning after dreaming a dream. Okay. 
and started writing. And I wrote every morning from four to six. No one knew I was doing it. My yeah. husband didn't know, no one knew. <laughs> and uh, in six weeks time, I had written my book, A Melody for James. Sweet. And halfway through it, I emailed it to my mother blindly. She didn't know it was coming. She didn't know <laughs> I was doing it. I didn't hear from her for weeks. Yeah. I thought, uh, she hates it. This is awful. Uh -huh. What am I doing? Why did I send it to her? Yeah. And one day at work, I answered the phone and she said, this is your mother. I want you to quit your job, go home and finish that book. Oh, how sweet. And I said, I finished it. I'll send you the rest of it. I can't so. tell you all what my mother said on my first book. It's really dirty. So, <laughs> so I, I thought, well, that was a fluke. You know, I yes. was 27. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I read, I didn't write. Yes, I exactly never written anything in my life other than high school papers and and so then suddenly I'm like overwhelmed with ideas and mm -hmm. in two years time I wrote 10 books Sweet. all between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and I didn't do anything with them I just they were just written and done under and your bed or in the closet inside the computer inside the computer okay. yep so and then I uh, divorced and just didn't do anything for a long time well, I've always written since I was a little kid. Um, I was, believe it or not, and this is God's honest truth, I was a horribly, painfully shy child. I had very few, I had no friends. I didn't know how to make friends. I didn't know how to talk to people. So I would make up these worlds where I had lots of friends and I could talk. And that kind of just stayed with me my whole life. Yeah. And it was kind of a safety mechanism during really rough times. I didn't have to deal with the real world. I could just go into my mind and make up stories that I can't talk about now because if I, yeah, well, I won't. <laughs> Out of respect for my children. But anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've always written. Always. And I in high school, I had notebook after notebook after notebook of books and screenplays and things like that. Um, and I tried writing an actual book book once when the girls were little. This was before even Michael was born. And uh, I had an old manual typewriter that I got at a yard sale for $3. <laughs> an old manual typewriter. But I never finished a book until I wrote Lazy Thought of. I yeah. never finished any book. So, But I always thought the first book I'd write would be like a, a thriller, a detective, something like that, because that's all I ever read were mm -hmm. mystery novels. You know, Grisham. Patterson, Ed McBain, and, and things like that. So, yeah, it's just a fluke. It is an absolute fluke. So, my mom liked my first book. She did because I wrote that one for her. So she said it needed more steam, and I'm cleaning that up because <laughs> I don't want to embarrass your your readers. So, <laughs> but I'll tell you that story another time. <laughs> so, but I I would not change my life for anything. I couldn't go back to a day job. I hang myself. <laughs> I'd walk beans before I went back to a day job. I just, I don't think I could do it anymore. And it's not because I'm spoiled. I have to write. I can't not, not write. I can't not write. I can't do it. Yeah. And if I go too long, like there's, I try to write every day. Um, I work every day. This is not a nine to five job by any stretch of the imagination. And there are some days where it's, you know, 18 hours that you spent in front of that computer that day. Um, either writing or doing whatever other work. But if I have to go too long without writing, writing, I get not nice. <laughs> I do. I get a little. Well, when my travel ramped up, my writing mm -hmm. kind of just stopped. Yes. So. But I have seven books completely plotted out. No, ten. Ten mm -hmm. books completely plotted out. They're just not. They're just plotted. But plotted. Um, detailed. Okay. See, I never used to do that. I never outlined. I never plotted. I just sat down and wrote. I was a complete 100% well, panster. My agent wanted <coughs> full, full stuff, and so mm -hmm. I, I plotted out a series and then mm -hmm. sent it to him, and and then he's like, "Well, what about that other one you were talking about?" And I plotted out another series and sent mm -hmm. it to him, and I have the third series that I that's completely plotted that I'm writing right now. Now, do you still have an agent? Mm -hmm. Okay. See, I don't have that. I'm just. I don't. And I'll keep my thoughts on agents to myself. I have an amazing agent. See, that's He's good. He's all supportive of, of indie. Yes, He's well, really that's good. Because not everybody is supportive of indie, of indie authors. Yeah. He's 
Hey, handsome. Are you still doing your? Yes, we are still live. He uh, he believes like I do about the future of publishing and wants to help him. And what do you think is the future of publishing? I think that large publishers Mm -hmm. need to learn to work with indie authors Mm -hmm. and let the strengths of indie combine with the strengths of their market Mm -hmm. to create a hybrid success. Rather than working against each other and thinking of com- competition, I don't foresee that happening anytime in the near future. Well, that's why we're looking for the publisher exactly. that will do it with them. Exactly. See, I wouldn't take a publishing deal. It would have to have, to have lots and lots and lots and lots of zeros after whatever number they want to put from one to, to nine in front of it. I just wouldn't it would be a big pay cut. <laughs> Well, that's why I think that it, it's something that the, they need to work together. I would, I would hope that that would someday happen. Yeah. So, right now there's this idea of, of them being in competition with each other, but as an indie author, I know that nothing sells my books more than my other books. Exactly. So. In, yeah. The traditional publishing, it's a totally different world. It's just a different thinking. Just it different is a total process. different process. Because, exactly. you know, there's, it was built on... It costs us tens of thousands of dollars to print these books. Mm-hmm. That's where the mindset came from. Mm-hmm. We don't have that anymore. No. So you just have to break the thinking. And I think that if they took a successful indie author like me mm-hmm. and played with it, yes. they would understand how well it would work. And so, and my agent is totally on board with that. That's so, fabulous. That's yeah. awesome. And so it's he's in you know discussions with people about. Well, play with it. See what, because I don't, oh, yeah, I don't care awesome. about the zeros. I don't care. See, I do. I'm a greedy old broad. <laughs> I gotta have, I've got four grandkids. I do. <laughs> Who all need ponies, no matter what my husband says. They right. all need ponies. <laughs> so, I, I just want to see the market. I'm too. still paying off my student loans. Okay, people. You're so funny. I am. I'm still paying off student loans. I just I'm see, over 40. I just want to see the market. Shut up, Michael. I just want to see the market like to, get better. I would like to see it change. I would like, yeah. and more and more people are becoming nicer to indies, I think. We're not so much, I don't think everybody sees us as the threat that they used to see us as. Well, in the Christian writing world, indies are seen as people who aren't letting God take control and they're doing shortcuts. And I don't agree with that. I don't. I am not going to say nothing. <laughs> if God wanted you to be published, you would have had a publishing contract. I'm sorry, no. No? No. He gives you lots of different avenues exactly. to work through. And so exactly. That's that's what I've had to battle the last five years is that mindset. But it's shifted now. Probably well, for the good. last two years, it's starting to get better. That's good. That's fabulous. Yeah. But I, I like being in control. I want to be the one who decides, I like that cover or I don't like that cover. Um, I've talked to authors who come from the traditionally published world and I have a grandson if you didn't see that ball flying through the air that'd be for my grandson um (laughs) they would say that you had to have x number of sex scenes in that book a certain set number regardless of whether or not it belonged in the story or if it was pertinent it had to be in there I don't have to write sex scenes well, neither do I. Exactly. Well, <laughs> but see, we're coming. I'm in 14th century Scotland, and you're in, in contemporary Christian land. Exactly. I'm I'm over here with the heathens, <laughs> and you're over here with the Christians. So we call them pagans. Pagans. I'm a, I'm just a heathen. I'm a pagan. I'm a heathen. Whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm really not. I am a Christian. I'm just not as devout as Allie. Uh, but I like the fact that. I get to control what is in that book. Yeah. And if I don't want any steamy sex scenes, I don't put them in there. You can still have passion in your books because there's a difference between passion and sex. We all know that. Sure. Um, but I've got some people who have called my stuff porn when it wasn't a sex scene in the entire book. They still call it porn because there were kisses. I get porn. criticized for all the sex scenes in my books. I know, like there are so many. There's no sex There's no. <laughs> I know. So you can't please everybody. You can't. It's impossible. You'll go crazy trying. Yeah. So, but I like the fact that I get, get to control what is in my books. I can control over how deep I want to get with the character. How how far back do I want to go? How deep do I want to go? Um, 
character names. Uh, like Myrmidoc. Myrmidoc McLaren. I killed him off too. <laughs> I like killing off bad guys. So I like that control. I can kill off all my bad guys. However I see fit. Whether, you know, it's an arrow to a heart or his throat is sliced or it's a grappling hook or whatever. I get to kill him <laughs> off however I want to. Push him off a cliff. Whatever. Um, but I love having that control over my covers, over the price of my books, over my narrator. Um, I talk to lots of traditional authors who don't get to choose who their narrator is. Yeah. And that just would drive me nuts. I'm too old. I am too old to put up with that kind of thing. I really am. Yeah, you're so, over 40. I am over 40. Thank you, dear. I'm well over 40. Shut up, Michael. Because um, you can't sleep in the garage tonight with all the spiders. In the garage. I'm so mean. You just take these little cushions in there and make you a bed. Um, I'd sleep in the car. So I do like having control over what goes into my books. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you do too. And what goes on the cover of the books. Sure. Now, how, what kind? what kind of... Does your agent have a say in any of that, or is that all up to you? No, and that's he's me. just okay. Yeah, and he's just like marketing you. Sure. Okay, that's cool. I just, you know, I feel I'm on the downhill slide, and <laughs> time for this. Well, I have spent the last 18 months traveling the world. Yes, literally the world. Talking about indie publishing to Christian writers mm -hmm. and Christian writer groups, and teaching workshops and seminars and conferences and you know i'm happy to help publishers understand it too but that's good that's good um i'm just too old and impatient to try to explain <laughs> it to them i go to conferences holly you know she's i love you i can't i'm down on the beach with my drinks that's all the conferences going on oh yeah i want to go to that class so i'll go inside take class and none of these will good go back out to the beach yep I'm so bad. I really am. I'm really bad. <laughs> but I do like going to conferences. They're fun. Sure. They are. I like the one at Romancing the Smoky Deep is good. That was a lot of fun. Donna I love Donna awesome. Wright. Donna yeah. Wright. I love you, darling. Um, she's not going to be doing anymore. That was the last one. That makes I me know. Sad. It makes me sad, too. Um, but I can still come see you whenever I want to. I don't have to have a conference to go to just to come to Kentucky to see my friends. Hallie, go because I want to. Yeah, I like that freedom too. So I like the freedom this this job gives you because your job is totally one hundred percent portable. Absolutely. All you need is your laptop or your notebook and, and pen. That's it. That's it. Now, do you carry a notebook in your purse? No. Oh, I do. I've got my spiral bound in there. My little steno pad so I can write down ideas because I got tired of writing them on the back of the seat. <laughs> or trying to figure out, hey Siri, take this this note, and then forgetting it's in there or I can't recover right. it because I don't know how. Um, <laughs> shut up, Michael. Uh, so yes, I always have paper with me. I can't stand going somewhere without. Like last night at yeah. dinner, I had paper. I had my steno pad because I didn't know if we were going to talk books or if we were going to talk. You know, what time do you want to start tomorrow or anything like that? Yeah, you might say something really important, which you usually do, and I would like to write that down so I don't forget. <laughs> So, anyway. Well, I think I'm done. Um, what about you? Anything else you want to say to your, your people, to your audience? No, I really enjoyed today. I, I have too. appreciated you sharing your readers with me. Oh, thank you for sharing yours with me. I hope yeah. it didn't terrify any of them. <laughs> They're not used to being around dirty old broads. I could tell that much already. <laughs> there was someone I was at a lunch on Thursday mm -hmm. t talking about coming here, and there was someone there and I, I can't remember who it was who wanted to know like you're like like they wanted to look up your books and <laughs> I was like no. well I'll you tag I'll tag you on Facebook with her name and I can't even remember who I was supposed to send that to so hopefully That's they're funny. watching hopefully they're watching <laughs> or they've seen my post going up yeah. all day about this exactly so. and my books aren't erotica they're not porn at least not my mind usually nobody does anything until after they're married usually they're not married it's usually behind closed doors so there you go you know it's the real world people it's 14th century scotland you can't get more real than that <laughs> but i love 14th century scotland men in kilts come on broadswords and horses and people painted blue it's, well no that that was, no, that, was, that, was earlier. that was a lot earlier so um just that sense of honor and duty and 
you know, wanting to save the damsel in distress, which she's not really, doesn't really need, not all my heroines need saved. Aggie needed saved. That's all there was to it. But my heroines are very feisty and perfectly capable, and they usually end up saying, saving the hero. So. One of the, uh, the first series I ever got addicted to mm -hmm. was Judith McNaught. <gasps> which was one? that? No. Which one? No, hang on. Julie... Julie Garwood. Oh, Julie Garwood's her historicals, her Scottish historicals. <gasps> the Velvet series. Oh, the Velvet. I haven't read the that? Velvet series. <gasps> no. I know. Okay. Who wrote it? Hell okay. Was, I never read. It was romance. either McNaught or Garland. I never read romance novels ever until Kevin gave me a Kindle for my birthday in 2010. And after the first month, he came to me. And Jude Devereaux. Jude Devereaux, okay. Velvet Promise, Velvet, Highland Velvet. Never read any of those. I know, okay. So anyway, so I don't read romance. All I've ever read in my entire life was murder mysteries because or spy novels or whatever because that's all my mother read. And I couldn't afford to buy books. We would go to like the Salvation Army, which we also call Aunt Sally's, which my Aunt Jerry all know what that means, and buy books for a nickel or a quarter. That was heaven. I mean, that was just, oh, all those books for a dime. So, but we always got the murder mysteries. So Kevin gives me a Kindle for my birthday, and he has it attached to his credit card. <laughs> he just didn't know. Um, so a month later, he comes, and he says, Honey, we got to sit down and have a talk. And he put me on book rations. Book rations! <laughs> I could only spend, you know, like $20 a month. And I'm like, you gave me this Kindle? I can just buy, click, you know, hit click and buy now. So... I discovered Lauren Whitting, 99 cents, and was hooked. Her books, that's what hooked me, and it was historic, Scottish historical romance. And I'm like, I, it was the description and the picture of the guy who killed or something like that in the cover. I'm like, Ooh, let's see what this is about. And I was immediately hooked from that moment on. Immediately hooked. Jude, it's, it was, yeah, Jude Devereaux. Mm -hmm. So Highland Velvet is, I'll have to check that out. Is that three or four brothers? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Okay. But they t they're British, and then there was the one in Scotland. Okay. And she was a laird. See, and I'm one so of my characters. Yeah, Fiona in uh, He took her name. He took her name. Yes, that happens in my books too. And her name was Bronwyn. Even you know how bad I am with names. <laughs> yes. Okay. Her name was Bronwyn. And their last names were Montgomery. Montgomery. And she has uh -huh. her series of Montgomerys comes to present day. Oh, wow, she that's so like, cool. i got to read that. I'm going to have to try that. I'm going to have to try that. And so I saw her speak last year at RWA, mm -hmm. or the year before at RWA, and she was talking about her writing process, and she has, like, giant notebooks, like three-inch binders, mm -hmm. filled with, it's like a scrapbook of her characters' lives. Oh, that's with, sweet. And, it, and so she has to build these books before she can write the book. Yes. And then she handwrites them. Oh. And Perry handwrites her books. And uh, I was, it was like, I'm looking at the creation of exactly. this book. I exactly. love this book. Exactly. It, was, it was really, really cool because I'm no longer a reader, but I used to be a reader. Oh, yeah. She was one of my go-tos. No matter who or what she wrote, I bought that book. The only romance writer I knew existed on this planet was Danielle Steele. I never read her books, but I just knew who Danielle Steele was. I knew she wrote romance. I never read Danielle Steele. I still haven't read Danielle My two Steele. authors were Nora Roberts and Jude Devereaux. <laughs> Well, and I, yeah. if you ask my readers who I write like, it's You'll Nora say, Roberts. Is it really? Okay. And I'm like, how can you compare a Christian author with Nora Roberts? Exactly. <laughs> so someone, people start leaving reviews for Layden's Daughter, and they said, oh, it was funny, like Julie Garwood. And then someone says, well, it's no Diana Gabaldon, or Gabaldon, or however you say it. And I'm like, who are these people? Who are they talking about? I, like I didn't know who Julie movie. Garwood was. I didn't know who Diana Gabaldon was. I didn't know who any of these... Tessa Dare, Hannah Howell. I don't know who these the people. The best are. Julie Garwood ever written was Lion, Lion's Lady. See, I haven't read that. That's good. I love all her Scottish. I've read all of her Scottish historicals this is, at least eight times. This each. is a white woman raised by American Indian tribe, been taken yeah. back to Regency Britain. Oh goodness, I'm gonna have to read that. <laughs> yeah, one. I to love where at one Julie. point she has like a, a socialite up against the wall with a knife to her neck. Saying, oh. Quit bullying me. <laughs> Quit bullying me? Oh, yeah, I'll have to read that. I'll have to read that. It was good. Um, but, yeah, I had to Google who Julie Garwood was. I went into Amazon. I'm like, okay, who's this Julie Garwood everybody's compared me to? I don't even know who that is. And I'm like, oh, 
98 pages of books. Are you people crazy? <laughs> She's won all these awards. She's amazing. Are you nuts? Yeah. 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 And then Diana Gabaldon. I'm like, Outlander, what is that? So I'm like, I've oh, never that read looks that. Good. Yeah. I only read the first book. I've only read the first book. And I did love it. But her books are really big. And I just don't have time to sit there and read all of that. But I do love the television series. I am hooked. No, I've never seen it. Oh, see. Oh, <laughs> Jamie Frazier. Ooh. I was. I went to the store one time and just picked a book off the shelf. I like murder mysteries too. Yes, I love murder mysteries. And uh, I, you know, cut my teeth on Agatha Christie. Yes. And so I just randomly picked up mm -hmm. a book off of you know bestseller list for the week at like you know Safeway or something, and went home and I started reading it and it was. Uh, like an island community off the coast of, you know, D.C. or something. I don't know. Nantucket or whatever. Uh -huh. And at one point in time, this female detective is sitting there with the sheriff of this little tiny island mm -hmm. community. And he gets up and he pats her on the head and calls her honey or something like that. And there was no Did rage. There, was, right, no there rage? was nothing. And I was like, wait. What? And I look, and it was copyrighted 1926. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, that's and why I thought, they oh, oh, that explains Let it. me restart this that book and start reading it, it with the with right that setting. Perspective. <laughs> yeah, the right perspective. Oh, my stars, that's hilarious. It was. Yeah. No, do not. Yeah, don't. No. Ah, I probably would have cut somebody. That was one because any, any contemporary mm -hmm. woman would have, and, and yes. there was nothing that indicated that this was that a was book until then. Oh, my stars. That is so funny. And I had, to, I had to restart the book so that I could, like, put it all right in perspective. That's funny. That's, you know, Kevin calls me baby doll. Now, any other man on the planet were to call me baby doll, I would gut him. I just would. You just don't, excuse me? Hello? <laughs> no. But Kevin does it. I'm like, <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I like being your baby doll. Yeah, he does that to me, even after 12 years of marriage. He's still does that to me. So, anyway, I think we're going to close up for now because yeah. I need some more coffee and another piece of that chocolate cake with the caramel sauce because yeah. that's really good. And we might want to think about dinner. What are we going to have for dinner? I, I don't think know. Think of peanut butter and jelly. I'm Did not cooking. <laughs> we should we order a pizza? Yeah, we should order a pizza. <laughs> Yeah, we've been cooking all day long, so I think if we don't... I just don't want to watch you wash dishes anymore. <laughs> we have paper plates. They're also a teenager in the house, so... I yeah, have no. barely eaten all day. <laughs> what? I've barely eaten all day. That's true. You haven't eaten a lot. That's your own so, fault. But that's your own fault. You're a picky eater. The meat pies were really good. I, I like the meat in them. <laughs> God forbid we eat a vegetable. Right. Yeah. Oh, my stars. My spontaneous like a bust. All right, we have enjoyed being with all of you today a lot. I've enjoyed being with Hallie, my, my, my good girlfriend. Um, and I think we're going to go scrounge for something to eat, maybe yes. some peanut butter and jelly or order a pizza. Pizza. But anyway, we love all of you very much. Thank you for putting up with us all day. Yes. We have had an absolute, absolute blast. And I hope been. we get to do this again. I do and I might make this, like, have Catherine Levesque in it. I think that's me. brilliant. And you know what? This is how Catherine and I would cook. Johnny's, we'd like reservation for <laughs> 10 cents. Because <laughs> I think Catherine's husband does all the cooking in their house. You need to bring him then. <laughs> yeah, bring him. Bring Catherine's husband. Anyway, we're going to sign off for now. And we love all of you. And yes, we will post the recipes. We will post the, the books. Well, Hallie will because that's not how I roll. But eventually I'll have all this stuff up on my blog. Just give me about 36 to 48 to 72 hours, and it'll be up there. But Hallie will have it all done tonight because that's how she rolls. Anyway, we love all of you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye-bye.